Welcome to this episode of Safe Home Podcast for struggling teens and their families finding their healing path. I'm Beth Syverson, a mom of an 18-year-old son, Joey, who has been dealing with drug addiction and mental health issues for several years. I am walking beside him as he struggles with his recovery while I work on my own personal growth and healing. Now, if you're new here to Safe Home, or even if you have been around but just haven't noticed, we have four main topics that we rotate through in our episodes. Addiction, adoption, mental health, and embracing diversity. Well, in today's episode, we will be going into those last two categories, mental health and embracing diversity. Our guest is Caitlin Vosberg, who has dissociative identity disorder or DID. And some of us might remember it with the previous name of multiple personality disorder. She is on a mission to destigmatize it and to encourage more compassion toward people who live with DID. She has an entertaining and informative TikTok account called A Part of Eight that you have to go check out. And in addition to all of that, she's also a mom of two little kids and she's an 11th and 12th grade English teacher and is getting her master's in education. Oh my goodness, I'm exhausted just listing all those things. That's incredible. So, and I know Caitlin because my wife's niece is her mother-in-law. So I'm so grateful to have got to know her a little bit, and there's still so much for me to learn about her and about DID. I think it's so important for all of us to understand what DID is and how we can better support people living with it. So welcome to Safe Home, Caitlin. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, thank you for being here, and thank you for for being a voice out there so people like us that don't know anything about DID can really understand it from your point of view. I think it's really important. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So first, I wonder if you could just describe what is DID for those of us that don't know. Yeah. So DID, as you previously said, used to be called multiple personality disorder until I want to say it was 1996. They changed it to dissociative identity disorder because researchers realized that it wasn't a personality disorder. It was actually a dissociation disorder. Um, So it's where your brain just kind of dissociates and kind of cuts itself off, which is what splits are. And it creates um, a different part of your personality to be more distinguished than the other parts in order to protect itself from any trauma that had happened before the age of nine. Okay. So do people only get DID if they've experienced trauma? Yes. That is the only way to develop DID is if you have severe and or repetitive trauma before the age of about nine years old. Okay. So, and the reason is after nine, your brain has developed further and can have other coping mechanisms in place. Is that why that nine-year-old cutoff? Uh, Not necessarily. So when you're, when you're born, you have what is considered to be the core personality. And as you're growing up from a baby to about nine years old, you're figuring out all of your different personality traits. Mm -hmm. And so if something traumatic happens, your brain doesn't quite know how to handle it. So it takes that certain personality trait that it was trying to integrate itself with, and it makes this thing called dissociative barriers. And that's what creates Uh. that quote unquote, multiple personality or just the alternate states of consciousness. Okay. But why couldn't that happen after you're nine? Because after nine years old, your personality is already formed and it's already oh, put together. I so, see. right. So when you're a kid, you don't know how to do that until about nine years old. Okay. Okay. That is so interesting. So you can't develop it later in life. So we have to really be careful with our little kids. Right. <laughs> it's like, right. That's really important. That's really important. And trauma is the only thing that causes it. Yes. It's as if your brain's like, cannot digest, cannot compute, and it splits. Is that, that's how you call it, right? You have yeah. a split and mm-hmm. you, your brain says, nope, I'm, I can't deal with this and I'm going to split and go over here. It, that's exactly, yes. Hmm. Okay. Are, are you willing to tell us any bit of what traumatized you or is that too personal? Yeah, I can share a little bit. I'm not going to actually say the names. Uh, I'm just going to abbreviate them just because I know some viewers it can be triggering. So when I was really, really little, about three, four, five, honestly, I don't really remember what age it was. I had experienced SA and that was the very first thing that I remember that was traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And I had been through two divorces from my parents, which 
is something that is categorized as being a part of trauma and it mm-hmm. happened to be the same people <laughs> they that, got married again yeah they got married again. again they were like yeah. let's do it again this is that fun. went so well okay <laughs> right <laughs> i had went through a ton of trust issues with my dad Mm. when he had gotten a new relationship basically immediately after um, the second Mm. divorce was over and it was hidden from me. Mm. I was lied to about it, just told they were friends and Mm. caught them not being friends. (laughs) (laughs) And that created one of my very strong altars. Okay. There's (laughs) the one that I think is really silly is I got bit by my dog when I was three. Okay. It sounds really silly, but it was so traumatizing for me that not only did it help the DID reinforce itself, but it also created something called a pseudo memory, which is a fake memory. So I don't even remember how it actually happened. I just created a scenario in my head. Oh, wow. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Those dog dogs can be traumatizing, especially when you're little and the dog is big and right attacking you. That's terrifying. Right. And it's, I think it's important to know that just because a person is traumatized doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get DID. It just, it's like a conflation of certain things that all happen at a certain level at a certain amount of time to a certain person. And the same trauma could have happened to a different person and they might not even register it. It's different people reacted trauma differently. Exactly. That's, and that's the key right there. Like I could, I don't do this anymore, but I could sit here and compare my trauma to my fiance's trauma Mm -hmm. and say, oh my God, you had it so much worse than me and you Mm -hmm. don't have DID. How is that even possible? Mm -hmm. And it's literally because we are completely different persons with different personalities. I just happen to be somebody who is more sensitive to the world around me. So I can get what's called third party trauma. (laughs) Somebody tells me a story and I get trauma from it. So it's it's difficult. Do they call it highly sensitive people? Is that the word for that nowadays? Yeah, it's um a sensitive personality trait. Okay. Does that mean you're empathetic and um, kind of a little bit psychic too? Or is that a whole separate thing? Oh, I don't know about psychic. Um, like, like super sensitive, super intuitive. Like intuitive? I mean. Yeah. I would say yes. I'm not really intuitive anymore just because it got to a point where the intuition and the people pleaser kind of clashed together. Oh. And I finally reached a point in my life about a year or two ago where I said, I'm I'm done. I can't oh, people please okay. anymore. And once <laughs> I decided that, the intuition kind of started oh. to fall away. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Well, it's probably better for you that, that way anyway. <laughs> yes. Good. Now, a little bit ago, you talked about your altar, one of your altars. What is an altar? So an altar is short for alternate states of consciousness. Um, it's just a fancy way of saying those little dissociative barriers between all of the quote unquote personalities. That's what an altar is. It's that different personality. Okay. And how many altars do you have? I want to say about 14. Wow. I thought you were going to say eight because the name of your TikTok. So it was, <laughs> it was eight. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was eight when we first created all of the social media accounts. Um, and then we started to self-reflect and meditate and mediate more. And it went from eight to 10 to 12. And then it went from uh, 12 to 14. And then it went from 14 to 13 because we had an integration happen. Okay. Uh, but then we split again recently. So it went from 13 to 14. Okay. Wow. It's exciting. And I notice when you say we, you're not talking about like you and your fiance, you're talking about you. Yes. Y- you refer you to, to yourself as a we. Yes. As we. I know you have an alter named Alex. Yes. That's a guy. Yes. So if you're, I don't know how you say it. If you are Alex at the time, what, how would you say that? If you're presenting as Alex? So, so if Alex is fronting, then that's just it. He's fronting. But um, say I. Yes. So currently it's, it's Emily. um, Cause I just, I take care of all of this stuff with the research and the explaining. That's literally my job. Um, Okay. But I know there's multiple around right now, such as Alex and V they're around. So that would be considered co-conscious. Okay. The best way to explain it is if you're driving a car, I, Emily, I'm in the driver's seat, I'm driving, I'm in control, and the others are in the passenger seat. They're just observing and watching. Okay. Now, are you willing to name off your 
uh, authors and kind of their roles? Yeah. So um, we have, I'm going to start off with the littles. I'm not going to give their actual names. I, we have uh, social media names for them. Okay, sure. So our youngest is four. That's TL. He's a male. He is specifically meant to hold trauma and he's mm. just a trauma holder. So mm. it's really messed up that our youngest is our trauma holder. But at the same time, it makes sense because four years old was when our trauma started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that just makes sense to us. And then our next one is Sunshine. She's a female. She's seven years old. We have no idea what her role is, but she's just happy go lucky all the time. She's she definitely holds no trauma. Um, nice. I love her name too. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then there's myself. I'm considered an internal helper. Which basically means I know the system workings. I know everything that's going on at all times, or I tend to know more than everybody else. I am also considered the host, which means that I am out the most taking care of the daily tasks. Okay. And that's Emily, right? Yes. Okay. And then I am also what's considered a caretaker, which is basically like a, a babysitter or a, a mom um, to specifically Sunshine. Okay. Um, and then there's Alex, who is our at the moment, secondary protector. He's also like our physical protector. So if we ever get sick or hurt, he's kind of the one that's triggered out and is like, I got this, you guys. Okay. <laughs> he's also the caretaker to TL. Mm, okay. And then there is, oh, there's Kayla. We honestly don't know what Kayla's role is anymore. She actually hasn't been around recently. So we're not quite sure what's going on with that. Oh, I forgot to say. So I'm so sorry. I forgot to say Emily, myself, I am 32 years old in the system. Okay. Alex is 19 years old in the system. And Kayla is, I want to say 22 or 24. I don't really know exactly anymore. Okay. And then we have Mr. Morris. I honestly have no idea what his role is. I think he's a gatekeeper, which basically is just telling us who gets to front and who doesn't get to front. Okay. And then there is V. She's our newest member. She is our primary protector. She is a, I guess, external caregiver. So she takes on the role of protecting others that cannot protect themselves. Okay. Which includes ourselves. So anytime something is wrong with our kids, she's immediately pulled out. She okay. takes care of all that. Or we also just realized if there's anything wrong with any of our students at school, she immediately uh... comes out. And then we have Mama, who is our primary gatekeeper. She's ageless. She literally has no age. Okay. And then there are two other altars that I have a hard time explaining who they are because I don't even know who they are, which is the beauty of having DID is because you can know how many members you have, but there are some that are going to hide from you. Okay. I remember when I talked to you the other time, that's the whole point of DID that a lot of people don't even know they have it because the whole point is the hiding and the non-integration because that's the whole disorder, right? Right. The dissociating. So is it rare to get diagnosed and to figure this out? I wouldn't say rare. It's not super common, but it's not rare. If you think about how many redheads you see or how many redheads that you've come across in your life, it's the equivalent of redheads. Wow. Um, diagnosed. So diagnosed. undiagnosed, wow, right. Undiagnosed. There could be we a have no plethora of more. Okay. And how, how old were you when you got diagnosed? 23. Okay. Is that about when people typically get diagnosed? It really just varies. I've heard of people getting diagnosed as young as 14. And mm -hmm. I have heard people as old as like 60s getting diagnosed. Really? Yeah. So it really just depends on the psychologist or psychiatrist that you see and how your symptoms present. I see. Okay. Did yours come to a head? How did, how did you get into that doctor's office to get a diagnosis? So the first time that we had gone was actually because our fiance had what we now know as an autistic meltdown, but we didn't know he was autistic at the time. So because of the scary thoughts he was having, naturally, I took mm -hmm. him to the doctor's mm -hmm. office and, mm -hmm. you know, put him in there. Mm -hmm. And that's where he talked to a psychiatrist and was like, hey, by the way, you have autism. All of these symptoms are your autism. And oh. I, he called me about that. And I was like, wait, that's not normal. Like, <laughs> what? I thought all of that was normal. And so 
I specifically, me, Emily, started thinking like, wait a second, if those symptoms are not normal, then maybe what I am experiencing is also not normal. So we called that same place and was like, hey, can we get an appointment? And because, of course, it was beautiful with COVID, we had to do an online appointment, like one of those telehealth appointments. And so we did a telehealth appointment. And at the end of that incredibly long appointment, she listed four different things. And one of the very last things she said was, oh, by the way, you also have dissociative identity disorder. First of all, I didn't know what that was. I barely even knew what multiple personality disorder was, let alone uh-huh. dissociative identity disorder. So to challenge that, I booked an appointment with a just a regular psychologist. And about six months later, she also said, no, you you have dissociative identity disorder. It was just really interesting because I was like, no, that's not right. Try again. And they were like, no, you really do have this. And I was like, oh, OK. And so did they they take take you in their arms and say, but don't worry, we've got you. We got help for you right here. Yeah. So my the my therapist that I saw that diagnosed me the second time, I actually still see her almost two years okay. later. Oh, good. OK, so they did help you out. Yes. Oh, good. Good, 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 good. What are the risks for somebody that has DID? Are they more, more prone to suicidality or addiction or anything like that? So dissociation is a spectrum disorder, just like how autism is. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And once you get towards the end of the far right of the dissociation spectrum is when suicide rates get really high okay. because you have to deal with depersonalization and derealization. And oh. those can very easily make life not feel real. And mm. so that's why the suicide rates are really high. Not knowing where you are when you switch is a huge oh. risk if you don't have communication between parts. Driving, depending on how bad your dissociation is or depending on system communication, can be difficult to say the least. But it's nothing like how Hollywood makes you think. Okay. It's not nothing like, like dangerous. Similar. Yeah, nothing oh, okay. <laughs> Nothing like Sybil or Billy Milligan, nothing like that. I keep telling people when they try to compare it to Billy Milligan or Sybil or the movie Split that if one alter can commit crimes, everybody can commit crimes, not just the one. Okay. It's not as dramatic as the movies make it out to be. No, it's more within yourself than with yeah. other people because there are alters that are called persecutor alters that their job is to quite literally harm yourself. Or mm-hmm. harm other alters. As, wow. Yeah, it has nothing to do with other people. The worst that can happen with other people is alters would like just push them away. Like, no, I don't want to be a part of your life anymore. Okay. Which is Alex's famous act. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a guy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Uh, how? Speaking of guys, how how did your fiance and your family? adjust to your diagnosis? Was that shocking? Or were like, oh, that clears a lot of things up. How did that land with them? So I've actually never talked to my family about this because it's difficult to have that, hey, by the way, you caused me trauma uh, yeah. conversation with my parents. And so it's, I don't want them to be uncomfortable. So if they would like to talk to me about it, I'm more than willing. It's just, I want them to come to me about it because I don't want to overstep. I see. My fiance, there's mixed feelings. And it's only because most of the alters are like, oh, we love you, or you're my best friend, or like whatever. And then there's Alex that's like, hey, you're cool, bro, or I hate you. Oh. And then there's V who's just flat out, don't even talk to me. So it it depends on who's fronting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but for the most part, he's pretty supportive, especially when our little four-year-old TL comes out and fronts. He's normally right there and he's normally like, you're OK. Everything's fine. You're not back in 2000 or whenever yeah. that was. Yeah. You're here in the present. You know, he'll mm-hmm. get fidgets for TL, like yeah. whatever he can. So he's really supportive about it. But they're also oh. hard times. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's you both got diagnosed around the same time. That must have just been such a woof. And both are are pretty major life changing diagnoses. Right. And then three Um, months later, our daughter got diagnosed. 
Oh, gosh. That just must be so discombobulating. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, how have you how have you wished people treated you differently or given you support differently? What can we do or what how let me frame that in a nicer way, uh, in a more positive way. What have people done that have felt supportive to you or what what do you wish people would do? So it really just depends on the person. It depends on the system because I like it when people ask me, hey, who's fronting? Mm -hmm. But I know there are systems out there that says, don't ask me that. Oh. So I personally like it when people ask me who's fronting because it makes that altar feel valid and feel mm -hmm. validated that this is something that happened. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not something that we as a system press on other people. To have that understanding that our symptoms are going to show up in real life, in real time. So you and I could be having this conversation and in three minutes, I could switch out to Alex or to V and it, if especially if it's V, it would literally be like, oh, wait a minute, what were we just talking about? I have no idea what we talked about. Um, and the famous one is just the what typical people call spacing out, uh -huh. which is dissociating or I like to call them brain breaks. Yeah. Um, which the really supportive thing that people have done is if they can see that we are dissociating, they'll kind of stop and they'll just sit there and wait for a second. Or there was one time in my classroom where I had two students who know about the DID mm -hmm. and both of them are super, super smart. And the one was talking to me and out of nowhere, because it's never predictable, I, you know, I just dissociated and kind of just spaced out, zoned out, kind of took a step back and the other student said, hold on, give her a second. And Aww. like in the moment it was embarrassing, but then looking back on it, it was like, thank you. Because everything Aww. you would have said after like the dissociation started, I would not have remembered. The one thing also people need to remember is dissociating, like dissociation does not equate switching. Oh, okay. Tell me the difference between switching and dissociating. So switching is when you completely switch alters dissociating okay. is kind of where you just take a step back from the wheel. Oh, just spacing out. Yes. Just spacing just... out. Okay. Um, okay. There are times when dissociating does lead to switching because that's how switching happens, okay. but it doesn't always mean that you're going to switch. Is it just your brain needs to just a pause? Like, yes. hang on a second, everybody. Just Yes. It's very common with people who have autism and ADHD to mm -hmm. dissociate, which I just learned that actually. Oh, interesting. And you have how much control over the switching? Zero or a little bit? We've been getting better at it. Okay. So I would say 30%, whereas a year and a half ago, it was 0%. Okay. Because there's four different types of switching. There is rapid switching, which is where it's, it's also called carousel switching. You're literally just going in a circle within a matter of mm. seconds, minutes, hours, mm. Um, there is also forced switching where an alter just kind of says my turn, you have no choice and throws you back. Uh -huh. And there's triggered switching positive or negative. So, mm -hmm. uh, trauma, uh, flashback comes back, that alter comes out or, um, our famous one is, um, lake effect snow with our sunshine. She, as soon as lake effect heavy snow happens, she's like, oh my gosh, that's my favorite thing. And she ends up coming forward. Um, that's always fun in the classroom. I typically have to shut the blinds when that happens. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, You're in Indiana, I should say. Yes. Um, and then there is also consensual switching, which is the controlled switching. It's, but just like typical consent, it's not always a yes. So I could sit here and be like, Hey, Alex, can you switch in? And he could say no. And that's the end oh, of it. Okay. That's not going to happen. Okay. But if he's like, yeah, sure. Then it, then it can happen. Um, huh. It could take a couple seconds, it could take a couple of minutes, or it could unfortunately take a couple hours. Wow. But that's something you have had to learn to do. Yes. It's not just something you get. So that's a growth opportunity if you have the energy and bandwidth to deal with that. <laughs> right. The better the sure. system communication, the better that control can get. Okay. So that's therapy and self-awareness and research. Like, how do you get better at that? 
those kind of things? So we had to start out with a dry erase board that showed when we switched and with who we switched. So it was a color coded board and it was quite often, it was like 20 or 30 times a day we would switch. Whereas now it's about seven to 10 times a day because we know our roles and we know what we're here for. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a binder where we would have to write notes in. And then when the other altar fronted, they would read it and then write their response because there was no communication. (laughs) Um, And then once we finally got the hang of communicating in real life, we were able to meditate and step back from the real world and kind of have um, like a headspace meeting. Uh And then once that became a regular thing, we started to learn how to talk to each other when real life was happening. So like Alex would be telling me right now, like tell her I said hi or something. I don't know. And I could like internally throw back. I'm not doing that. And it, it happens uh-huh. now. Whereas uh-huh. a year ago, that would not have been able to happen. I could be able to hear them, but I couldn't be able to throw dialogue oh. back. Wow. You must have so much insight and just self-awareness to be able to do this work. It's a blessing and a curse. I know. It sounds really hard and exhausting. Plus you're in school and teaching and ha- and parenting and fiancéing. <laughs> <laughs> And that's just so much. I don't know how you do all that. How do you keep it all together? Um, <laughs> we don't. No. <laughs> um, that's the part of having a blessing come out of DID is that mm-hmm. I deal with the school and the college, whereas mm-hmm. V typically deals with the kids. And okay. Alex... I, he's just vibing at this point. Like, okay, okay. <laughs> he's kind of like a backup. If anybody else gets tired, then he kind of just comes in and is like, okay, okay. I'm going to give you a break for a hot minute. Um, yeah. But also serious planning really helps. And mm. honestly, if we did not have the communication we have, I I don't think we, we would be able to do all this. Yeah. It sounds like a, a major job, like a, an extra whole job is just managing all of your parts. Right. So right. Literally, right? Yes, literally. Yesterday we had gotten sick. Getting sick is actually one of TL's really strong trauma triggers. And so yesterday was basically a TL day um, because we have a lot of chronic nausea. And with our chronic Mm -hmm. nausea comes a lot of um, religious trauma and it comes a lot of emotional neglect and just a lot of different things that TL is right there for, unfortunately. Wow. So yesterday was a tough day. Yes. Yeah. And okay. So just talking with me now, it's been Emily this whole time. Mm -hmm. Would I know it if you switched? No, not unless you know us. Like if I knew you real well, really well. Yes. There Mm -hmm. are even Tyler, we've been with him for eight years. Mm -hmm. or almost eight years. And we've only been diagnosed for about two years now. Mm -hmm. There are times where most of the time he can tell, but there are other times where he has no idea. He just, you know, just go on about his day, not thinking that we've switched at all. Um, Mm -hmm. Same, same way with people at work, like our students, sometimes they can tell something is a little off, especially if V has fronted Mm -hmm. um, because she came into the system knowing to not mask. Uh, because she is a very strong, she's just a very strong personality. Um, and then we also have, um, one of our new, we have a new friend, which, uh, is just really weird to say because Alex has, uh, not liked friends. (laughs) So, oh really? yeah, we haven't had a friend for five years because of Alex. So now that we have this new one, she's actually, um, an intuitive So she's the first one that we've ever come across that can tell exactly when a switch happens, even if we don't recognize a switch happens. Okay. So this is a friend in real, like, I don't know how to say in real life, like an, like an outside person. Yes. Outside of your system. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about friends in your system. Okay. So you have an outside friend. Alex hasn't let you had friends for five years. Yes. Okay. So you have an outside friend that's an intuitive and they can tell. Yes. I wonder if animals could tell. Yes. Do you have any animals? One coming in right now. Hello. What kind of animal? This is Lucy. Oh, she's cute. 
Uh, so Lucy can tell or acts differently around you when you yes switch to a different um, especially with uh, TL and Sunshine when when TL is around our dog gets a bit more clingy um, mm. and then when Sunshine is around she's not clingy but she follows more than she normally does oh interesting interesting now okay we have a lot of parents that listen to this podcast what if somebody has a child that has suffered trauma and they they have like an imaginary friend or they're talking to themselves a lot. Should they be concerned? I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't be concerned just because that's only one part of DID. And it's very common for kids to have imaginary friends. Mm -hmm. um, I would be concerned if they don't grow out of that imaginary friend by the time they are about nine years old. OK, because something's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. either they're just a late bloomer and they just keep that actual imaginary friend, or it is possible that they have developed DID, but there's mm -hmm. so many different, um, things that parents can also look out for. So definitely the imaginary friend or talking to themselves, the spacing out is definitely key. Mm -hmm. Um, changes in behavior. And this is going to be hard for parents because especially just kids can be moody, you know, they can just kind of flip a switch. Like my kids yeah. can definitely do that. They just flip a switch and I'm like, whoa, where did this attitude come from? <laughs> but if all of that is combined with a lack of memory, then I would definitely mm -hmm. take them to a specialist or just mm -hmm. a psychologist or somebody. Um, because growing up, I was told, oh, don't mind her. She has short term memory loss. No, mom, I don't. I have DID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You so, didn't know it then, but... Right. Because little kids don't have short-term memory loss, typically. No. That's not a trait of little kids. They usually have really good memories. Exactly. Whereas I so. would forget so often so many basic things. I bet you got in trouble a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Teachers probably are like, God, you forgot your homework again. What's yeah. going on? Yep. Yeah. So if somebody were diagnosed younger, that would be better, right? Yes, because they can get that awareness and that um, self-reflection and that trauma therapy quicker rather than later. Yeah. yeah. What else would you like us to know about DID? Is there anything that I didn't ask or anything you really want us to know or um, do? Really just that it's, it's a real diagnosis mm -hmm. because I know for the longest time, um, specialists even did not think it was real even though that's not as common for that to have be a thought anymore because there is so much research about it. Um, okay. But because psychologists said it one time, like 20 years ago, people <sighs> are still clinging on to that idea of it's not real. Unfortunately, it is real. Mm -hmm. I guarantee if you talk to anybody that has DID, they would love to say it's not real. Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, it is real. People that have DID are valid and what they went through, they should not have gone through. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's not okay, first of all, for them to go through that. They did not know any better. It is not their fault. Right. Absolutely. That is the biggest thing. It's, it's not your fault. Yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking about the, the fact that trauma is what causes this disorder. And then I wonder how many people get traumatized because of the disorder by outside forces, like the culture being just mean or dismissive or whatever. And then how traumatic it is to have to deal with all of the happenings in your mind the rest of your life. I mean, that it just seems like trauma heaped on trauma heaped on trauma. Yes. There, um, unfortunately, there have been systems out there that have taken their own lives because of how the world perceives them, yeah. um, which unfortunately there's really not much you can do about that except advocate and get your voice out there and try to drown out the noise. Yeah. Is that why you made the TikTok account? Yeah. Part of, part of the reason was because I really wanted to let people know that you're not alone. You got this. And I've actually had a lot of people comment on videos saying, wait, I didn't know this had a name to this, or I didn't know this was a symptom. I've even had a couple of people say that because of my videos, they went out and started seeing therapy 
for these things. And I'm like, okay. that's amazing because Beautiful. there are still people out there that say therapy is for wimps or whatever. And it's like, yeah. um, clearly you have never been to therapy. Yeah. <laughs> like oh, therapy for everyone. Right. You get therapy. You get therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Well, I love your TikTok because it's funny and irreverent and honest and vulnerable. And it, it you and I both believe in the destigmatization of all these things that have stigmatized people and kept us down. And I love just the energy that you put into it. It makes it accessible, not so scary for us trying to learn about it. Not like some sacred cow that we're going to, I don't know, piss somebody off. Right. It, you make it feel like, okay, I could ask maybe a person a question about this because Caitlin's out there, you know, on TikTok. Right. Yes. Sharing, sharing, we always try to experience. answer every single question that we get. Oh, I nice. mean, we haven't been on TikTok that long, but just just to be blessed by the people that we have touched and that we have validated and mm -hmm. the the growth that we have had is absolutely unbelievable. And I'm incredibly thankful. That's really it's really great. It's really, really great. I remember the one about orange juice. Oh, my. Like one of your ah. authors likes like what is it, the chunky kind of orange juice? Okay, here's the thing. No one likes pulp orange juice in my system. No one likes it. Alex was just being a jerk. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so no, it all started. Oh my gosh. It all started with the crunchy peanut butter video because I went to go make a peanut butter jelly sandwich or something. And we had only one kind of peanut butter, which is fine. So I opened it up and I was like, why is this chunky? I don't like chunky peanut butter. Who in my system keeps buying chunky peanut butter? <laughs> so I made a video because for some reason, like there are days where we don't have good communication. So I made a video yeah. because I wanted to know which alter was buying chunky peanut butter. And yeah. it turns out it was Alex. Alex likes chunky peanut butter. Oh, OK. And so he decided to go out of his way to buy pulp drinks for me just um, to piss you off just to make me mad <laughs> and and like i'm not mad about it anymore it's just annoying and it's only because um that's alex was the one he's the one that is meant for like my dad's side of the family and my dad's side of the family shows love by sarcasm and playing jokes and playing oh. pranks. And so I know he's just showing love. And so I'm not oh, mad okay. about it, Okay, but like it's really frustrating when you dump out good orange juice and then <laughs> dump in pulp orange juice because that was gross. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Now, one one thing that I find very curious is that your name is Caitlin. I, I'm sure that's what you put on your legal papers and all that. Yes. But when you listed out your altars, there was none named Caitlin. Nope. She Where, where is Caitlin in this whole situation? She last year she had integrated with Alex. Um oh. integration is a good thing. Um, that means the system is healing. That means the, uh -huh. the brain is healing. It's getting to the correct direction. Um, okay. which I do need to point out, there is a difference between integration and fusion. Um, integration okay. is when one or more parts collides together with another altar and they either like stay that same altar with minor differences or it creates a completely new altar. Okay. And fusion is where every single altar comes together and creates that, that one whole personality. I know a lot of people get those two confused. But that's what happened is that Caitlin integrated with Alex. Okay. Okay. But do people still call you Caitlin? Yes. We're not picky on what people call us. If they're comfortable calling us Caitlin, that's what we go by. If they're comfortable calling us our alter name, that's what we go by. It's whatever is comfortable to that person because we are not going to press anything on others. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's very nice of you um, because I'm sure if you were all picky about each one we'd mess it up all the time and then you'd be angry right <laughs> right well, that's a, probably a really wise choice and you mentioned fusion is that the goal is that the ultimate goal for people with did it again depends on the person because there are people that want the final fusion and there are people that have had the final fusion but there are also people out there that want something called healthy multiplicity and that's where you still have the DID, but you have worked through the trauma. You have healthy communication, but all of your mm -hmm. altars and your distinguished parts are still there. Um, me personally, I don't know what we want because okay. Alex wants final fusion. He does not want to be a part of a system, uh, whereas Kayla 
wants the healthy multiplicity. And I'm just kind of along for the ride at this point. Okay. I can see both sides of that. Right. You know, just a little tiny bit. I know it seems like, okay, part, parts of that sound good and parts of that sound good. So right. I guess maybe it will just be what it is. I don't know. Right. <laughs> That's where <laughs> I'm at right now. choice you have with it anyway. <laughs> wow. Um, if people wanted to get a hold of you, what would be the best way? So we have Facebook, which we have Messenger for Facebook. We have mm-hmm. an Instagram. You can message us on Instagram. We also have an email that people can email us. And I believe that's it, actually, because I don't think people can message us on TikTok. So in all those places, you'd look for a part of eight. Yes. Spelled out E-I-G-H-T. Mm-hmm. Right. And I will, of course, list all those in the description of the podcast so people can click on it. But in case they're not somewhere where they can look at their phone, they can just go look up a part of eight. Yes. Very good. Well, I hope people really check it out and get educated and entertained by your delightful videos. And it's just so interesting. I think it's it's fascinating what the brain does and how it can heal and change. And oh, yeah, yeah. There's so much, there's so much to learn. So I hope this episode gave everybody some new knowledge and some more understanding and compassion for people that, that live with DID. I'm sure it's not easy at all, but hopefully the world will continue to become more accepting and more a safe place for you, for you to live and grow. So thank you very much for being here, Emily yeah, and Caitlin of course. and everybody else. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. And thank you everybody for listening to, you can find safe home podcast on all of those places that Caitlin was mentioning. And we also are on Patreon. If you'd like to support us with a small monthly donation, you will get a few goodies with that. And you can be in kind of the inner circle of safe home and shout out to our newest Patreon member, Camille Hatton. Thank you so much for your support, Camille. So you can find all those links down below the episode as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your support of our family and for being open to embracing these diversities in all sorts of different people. Thank you, Caitlin, again. And we both want you all to stay stay safe. safe.